welcome everybody. Uh, this panel is uh, on our student perspective to the use of technology and remote instruction over the last 18 months. And we'll also take a look into the future and see what our student panelists also think they'd like to see in the use of technology moving forward with whatever might come next. And so the COVID-19 pandemic and the move to remote instruction has challenged instructors, students, and the entire university to teach, learn, and offer courses in new ways and new modalities. Technology became a big part of how courses were offered during this time, how instructors taught, and how students learned. This March 2022 will be the two-year marker for uh, remote instruction. And as we approach the inflection point between what we've been through and what's going to come next, it's important to pause and take stock of our experiences during this time and also take a look and see what may be in store for us in the future. And so today's panel will do just that. We'll hear from four SF State students on their experiences using technology during remote instruction. And based on these experiences, what they'd like to see for the future use of technology in teaching and learning. The panel sponsored by our campus academic technology advisory committee, which brings together faculty administrators and IT providers to assess and plan for needs around technology as it is used in teaching, learning and research. And I wanna thank the committee and the membership for helping plan and put this panel together. My name is Andrew Roderick and I oversee the academic technology unit <clears throat> and I'll be moderate, moderating today's panel. Um, you should look forward to similar events in the coming spring involving students and faculty and related to technology. So, um, so look forward to that. So Ethan Cortez is a freshman who transferred from a Southern California high school and uh, uh, transferred this fall. He's a business management major and chose SF State because of the location and the reputation of his major program. Uh, welcome, Ethan, to the panel. Patricia Parabek is an extended education student in the paralegal studies program. She's adding the paralegal certification to an undergraduate degree in psychology and two master's degrees in education. Uh, she came to SF State because of its diversity and welcoming atmosphere. Nihal Pirohit, is a student in the family interiors nutrition and apparel major with a focus on interior design. She chose SF State because of its diversity and the reputation of the program that she's in. So welcome Nehal. And Joyce Bulatow is a sophomore majoring in mechanical engineering. She expects to graduate in spring 2023. And as an engineering student, she typically works with advanced discipline software such as SolidWorks and MATLAB. Welcome Joyce and welcome to all our panelists. We'll shift gears here now and turn it over to you. I'm gonna start by introducing a question and I'll call, on, <clears throat> I'll call on each of you to kind of move through and respond. So if you could describe your experience using and relying upon technology over the last 18 months of remote instruction, and talk to us a little bit about what worked well and what was the most challenging aspect. Nahal, I'll start with you. Hi, everyone. So um, I would say that my biggest issue was with Wi-Fi. Um, everybody, like my brother was working from home too. My dad was working from home. My mom already works from home. And I was doing now school from home. So Wi-Fi was always a big issue and I really appreciated it when the professors would record the lectures and post it for us to view at another time, especially when um, it was hard to communicate in class because of the bandwidth issue. Sometimes a voice keeps cutting out or um, something would just go wrong. So that was one issue I had. Um, another thing that worked well for me was the professors who posted their lectures online. I would say that Zoom and like iLearn was a really big plus because it kept me on track and had um, all the information like provided, which I might have missed during class or just didn't hear because my Wi-Fi cut out. Thank you, Nahal. 
Um, if I could just ask a follow-up, in terms of your Wi-Fi, what kinds of things did you use to mitigate that issue? And uh, how was the university able to be responsive or not responsive to that need? Um, so for example, over the summer, for a short amount of time, I lived in San Francisco and that place had like horrible Wi-Fi. So I would have to go down to like a coffee shop nearby use my like personal hotspot and then connect through there, which made it like solve the issue half and half. Um, but my professors were very understanding and allowed me to like ask follow up questions, um, <laughs> gave me some time, like other than office hours to like make a Zoom call with them and ask them any particular questions, which really helped. Thank you. Patricia, if I could turn to you, same question. Okay. Um, well, I just kind of want to start with, I really feel like many aspects of my education are better because of remote learning. And um, I do not feel any type of social disconnect at all, which I think is really interesting. In fact, you know, I feel like with remote learning, I've actually been, it's enabled me to build stronger connections um, with the classmates and instructors. And I've just been able to make a lot of friends, network with um, fellow students. And sometimes I find like with in-person learning, you sit in a lecture and you take notes. And with remote learning, you have to speak up and contribute more. And so I like that. And I think for people, like me, and I do have social anxiety. So this is a little nerve wracking for me, even this format. But for people that have social anxiety, I think it's great because you're just so much more comfortable to chat through video, you're more confident in your interactions. And so you can learn more, you're just at greater ease. So I just really wanted to say that because I have had such a positive experience with this that I, I can't even tell you, it's really been wonderful and I hope it continues. Um, uh, I really appreciate, um, as one of the other panelists said, when the lectures are recorded, when they're, when they're posted online, that's really helpful. And it's so helpful too, because you can just go back, stop, rewind. Um, that's been great. Um, as far as challenging, probably just learning how to navigate new software and just coming into this. Um, I'm an older student, so I'm not great at, you know, technology. I wasn't raised with technology. And so maybe sometimes there's a little bit of an assumption that people know more about technology than they do. So for me, um, it, it Zoom's been a little hard to you know, kind of like navigate my screen and then I have to research something and then, but I've been in a chat room and trying to figure all that out at the same time can be difficult. So um, that's been a big learning curve for me. But it's, it's just really been a really, really wonderful experience for me. I couldn't ask for anything better. Great, thank you, Patricia. Thank you for sharing. Joyce, I'm gonna to turn to you. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, my experience with using and relying upon technology, I would overall say it was a work in progress, but I have adapted to the circumstances. Um, and I'll get into some challenges that I faced first. Uh, for one, with timed quizzes and exams, not every student has a tablet where they can just submit their writing electronically. And a majority of students write on paper, then usually have a grace period of five minutes to pull out their phone, use a scanning app such as Cam Scanner to scan each side and then submit. And more than once, whether it's because of the file size, connection strength, et cetera, I've turned into quiz or exam late in those five minutes, even though I have finished and stopped working in the time allotted. And this is one of the many problems that I've run into. When I click and drag the assignment, to upload on iLearn, you see the loading bar and then it stops towards the middle or at the very end and it stays that way. And it either takes forever to load or it doesn't complete um, loading at all. And afterwards I'd have to email the professor my work, explain the situation and sometimes risk 10% being conducted because it wasn't turned in the correct submission method. Um, another challenging aspect was having a lot of Zoom classes back to back. And I think that took the biggest toll on me, toll on me mentally 
Um, a new term I learned this semester was Zoom fatigue. It's different when it's in person, you know, because you have a change of environment, you get a little chance to walk around campus to get from one class to the other. And with Zoom, there are countless days where I didn't realize that I've been sitting nonstop for the past six hours. And because my laptop is right in front of me, I work on homework or do notes while waiting for my next class. And then my next class begins and I feel like, oh, I've been sitting in the same place for a long time now. And moving on to the next question, what worked well was having a recurring Zoom meeting link for the class, I would say. Most classes do do this. Um, it's simple, it's easy. Um, I can have it on my Google Calendar ready to go and can join from a laptop or my cell phone in a few seconds. However, I've had a couple experiences where professors would either have a different Zoom link for each week or a different Zoom link for each day of the week. And it is a bit of a pain to have to log into my iLearn page each time before class. And it can be a bit of a hassle, especially when it's just a few seconds before class begins. So I do appreciate and I like the simplicity of having one Zoom link for, Zoom link for the entire semester. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, great insights. Mm -hmm. Ethan, uh, can we hear from you? Of course. Hello, everybody. Uh, so talking from my personal experience, I was in high school last year, so it was a little bit different for me. Uh, the high school that I was at and took part in, they had a system where it was like it was all online for me as well. And I think that what worked really well over there was that it was just it was organized. It was very well organized. Uh, uh, my grades would be posted in one specific place. My classes were listed in one specific place. Assignments. There was a checklist so I could know when things were due. Um, and I feel like that's one of the downfalls that I, like one of the things that isn't working too well now is that it's difficult for me to have everything. You know, I have four different sites for each of my classes, so it's different places I need to go. Um, so I think that breakout rooms are a huge thing, piggybacking off of what Ms. Parabek said about social anxiety. Uh, I'm right there, you know, talking a little weird on Zoom, but I think that's definitely like a huge thing. Even the breakout rooms, when I go into them, no one ever talks. I think that's a huge part of why the Zoom classes that I'm in now just seem to be kind of not as interpersonal as the uh, in-person classes. I think that could just be solved by the one class I do have where it's the same group of kids, every breakout room or students. It works really well. Like you, you're put with the same people and I think it gives me the opportunity to create an actual relationship uh, with other students. Ethan, can you elaborate? You said you have to go to four different sites. What, what are those sites you're referring to? Well, so I have iLearn for some of my classes where the stuff is on there. I have uh, MindTap and Cengage for my math and economics class. And then I have another one specific for my Latino culture class. And the only issue with that is it, it's great and each one works well for the individual classes. The problem is it's difficult for me to maintain like when things are due or keep things in order um, just with it being in three different places for every class. Same thing with passwords and stuff as well. Um, which I know it's not that big of a deal, but like every single website requires a different password, a different login. Some don't use the SFSU logins. Uh, so that's a little bit confusing as well. Great. Thank you, Ethan. Um, just playing off of a couple of the things that were raised in each of your comments. So Nihel brought up some of the bandwidth and access issues. Um, did any of you experience that in addition to Nahal, either on the bandwidth side, dealing with your internet access or on the device side, like working with a device that wasn't potentially compatible with something that you needed to do to complete coursework? I've had a few issues living on campus with the uh, internet connections. I live in uh, the Village Towers and we've had a few times where Apogee just won't work. Uh, and so if I'm in class, it's difficult. Like I have one of my roommates doesn't have a personal hotspot. And so he's missed like three classes uh, because of the Wi-Fi just cutting out. Um, and I think that also goes back. I feel like the most that I've seen with Wi-Fi problems is actually teachers and professors where they'll just be on Zoom and then cut out for 10, 15 minutes and then come back and they think they were presenting the whole time. And then they kind of just restart. You lose a little bit of class time. I will also had the same situation as the hall where a lot of people in my home were on uh, the Wi-Fi at the same time. And so I would have Zoom sessions where all of a sudden I would get your connection is unstable and then it would kick me out and then it would put me back in and then kick me out. And um, it would happen multiple times in one session. Thank you. 
Um, additionally, Joyce, you brought up Zoom fatigue, um, which I'm sure so many of us are uh, very familiar with uh, these days. Um, can you all talk a little bit about what that was like balancing um, simultaneous or, or sequential Zoom sessions, but also just sort of what the whole impact of the last 18 months did sort of on the emotional side of things while you're trying to manage classes in your own life, um, uh, but you know, compounded by some of the demands of, of coursework that you have while you're going on. Um, you know, how did you contend with that both you know, from a Zoom fatigue aspect and just from a larger sort of just personal management around how you deal with your courses? Um, so definitely when online classes and everything first started like two years ago in March, um, I realized like for weeks at a time, I never stepped outside my house. I woke up, went to my Zoom class, then like lunch was indoors, worked on homework, had another Zoom class. And then by the time it was already like night, there's just no place to go. So like I'm in my house for like five days out of the week, which was like really bad for me, I guess, because I was just like not talking um, to anybody really outside like the people in my class. Um, so then eventually I started being like, okay, I have to start taking a class and go to the library and take it or go to like a coffee sh like shop and take it because I had to get out of like my home environment. I would even take my classes like in my backyard or front yard just to have like a different view because it was so hard to focus on one laptop screen for so many hours and slip flipping through slides working on like you know AutoCAD on one side but then zooming back to like the zoom video to see how to do that then like going back it was just a lot so I had to just change up my scenery in order to feel better about taking these classes. Adding on to that, just really quick, I completely agree. I mean, I had, I was a senior in high school. So it was like my entire senior year, I was in my house on Zoom every day for like six hours, um, which is why now that I'm doing hybrids, I have a few in person and a few online. It was honestly the best thing I could have ever done. Um, I know some people still aren't doing that. And I, I know that for them, especially the people I know in, in the dorms and stuff, it's harder to have like any type of social outlet, uh, especially with other students. Um, it's been difficult to like get to know people, but I think that having just in-person classes to give yourself the opportunity to get out um, and be back in that environment was super helpful to me. I wanna wrap this section up by just asking uh, any of you that wish to answer this particular sub question. Um, can you talk a little bit about what successful things your, your faculty or your instructors did during this time to address some of those issues you brought up? Like what was a great experience? What was a great thing that somebody did that kind of like helped, uh, helped make it more manageable? Um, for one of my classes, we actually took like a week off of the normal class and he made us kind of like do an outdoor activity. Like it was mandatory for us to kind of do something outside, whether it was like go on a hike or even like go to our front yard. Like he made us go outside. And I really like some students have like a hard time with it. But I think like at the end of the day, we needed to like step away from like the screens and not be looking at like a little 13 <laughs> inch screen all day. I have um, a professor that kind of has some informal office hours before class. And I just really appreciate that. It's just kind of an informal hanging out session where you can talk about current events. You can talk about what's going on in your life. You can ask questions about the class, just whatever's on your mind. And um, I think it's really important to have just some way to build in time for community building and for socializing um, somewhere in there. Uh, I, I really just appreciated those opportunities for the casual interaction. I think that that's really important because, you know, again, I just feel like, you know, I'm a teacher, learning, teaching is all about relationships. It's just so important. And so if we can do that, just create those opportunities, um, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, I will add on to that. I do have a couple professors who, before the class starts, you know, before we get right into digging into the material, ask, how is, how's your day? 
or how are you feeling? Or they come out with an icebreaker question and everyone types in the chat, oh, I'm planning to do this this weekend. Oh, I did this. I learned this while in quarantine. And I feel like it's a nice refresher before, um, you know, we get hit. Um, we start getting into learning because I feel like I can actually um, meet these students without actually seeing them in person, but hearing more about their lives. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I really appreciate that. I, I appreciate the professors who, who want to know more about you rather than just want to teach you um, the entire classroom. Uh, piggybacking off that as well, um, I have one professor, my comms professor, is amazing at doing this, where she starts off the class and individually will address specific students, um, you know, by name, which is always great because you'll go on, she'll call you out um, and just ask how your day was, what you had for breakfast, something random just to break the ice for class. Um, and now through the semester, because of her doing that, like, I'm more comfortable in the class. I turn my camera on now. For, for honestly, for just that class because of the relationship that I have with the professor and the other students, because she gets everybody to conversate. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, really interesting responses and, um, and challenges and successes and uh, everything that goes along with that. In terms of our next segment, we're gonna take a look forward and given your experiences using technology as part of remote instruction over the last 18 months, what would you like to see change as the uni university moves forward into what may come next? We are, uh, we are partially in person and partially remote right now. We will remain so in spring. Um, what comes next is, for, for SF State and for all other universities across the country is sort of an open question for next fall. Um, but as we look forward and you've kind of relied upon technology during remote instruction, maybe used it in ways you did not before, your instructors have used it in ways they have not before. Um, what would you like to see carry forward in the use of technology and um, what would you like to see more of? And maybe what would you like to see less of? And I'll go ahead and start with Joyce this time. Hello, everyone. Um, one thing that I do want to see, uh, if possible, um, I know that some students have been logged out from iLearn at times where they've been required to change their password or something is wrong with their student center, items they're not loading. And for any tech problems, we would usually have to email IT, but sometimes that can cause a delay when having to email them and wait for a response and get back to them. But one thing would be like a live help desk. Mm. Um, I've had that for a career fair and it was super convenient because if anything happened, I just hop straight into there and then let them know any issues that I have. Um, in terms of other things I'd like to see more of, I'll uh, that would be more of my classes offering more opportunity for hands-on learning. And I'll get into specifics a bit about what I mean by that. Firstly, I live about 15 minutes from SFSU, which means that it's convenient for me if I need to stop by the campus. And so one of the required courses for my major is Engineering 206, which is Circuits Lab, where we learn about electrical measurements. Uh, we use laboratory instrumentation and verify circuit laws and theorems. And so this semester and in the past semesters, I've been I'm taking it virtually and students have taken it virtually. I am more of a hands-on learner and it's difficult for me to watch a video demonstration of what I need to learn. When it comes to lab equipment, especially, I just need to physically have it in front of me and with the professor or other peers nearby so that I can ask specific questions about what I'm confused about and have it answered on the spot, especially if it's complex. I'm sure there are other students in the classroom who are in the same boat as me when I say that it's just more helpful and convenient to physically be in the learning environment, like in the classroom. And the great thing about this professor is that they teach the same lab, both virtually and in person. So for those who like being more hands-on like me, this professor gives an invitation to their students who, to join the in-person one if they really need to. If they're really stuck on a problem or are having an extremely difficult time learning the material. And I do believe about three or four students actually go in when they need that help. And so back to my main point, I understand that more lower division classes or labs will be offered in person next semester. But for those who are still virtual, it'd be really helpful to those students who want to go in for the extra support 
and to further their understanding, further learning. And what I would like to see less of, <laughs> this applies to labs as well, or any class that is longer than an hour and a half. But for the longer classes, I would like to see less of expecting the students to have their camera on for the entire duration. Um, <laughs> I mainly use a laptop for my classes. And the one thing that I've noticed since the beginning of the semester is that when I'm in lab or on a Zoom call, my camera is on, we probably have a simulation running and I'm on a Google Doc with four other students editing it at the same time for three hours, which means my laptop is running low on battery and it needs to be plugged in for the rest of class so it doesn't die on me. And me personally, my laptop gets super hot. And so I've gotten warnings about my battery using significant energy. The fan is on very loud, things are crashing on me and I get frustrated. And so for a laptop user, I don't have a PC. Um, it sometimes feels overwhelming and I'm always hoping that nothing suddenly stops working. Uh, people do not need to see me struggling behind the camera. And so, like I mentioned for labs in my personal preference, I don't feel like I need to have the camera on for the entire duration. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Ethan, I'm going to move to you. All righty. Um, piggybacking off what Joyce said, uh, I have something to, about the cameras on as well. So I have a few classes where they just require the cameras on all the time. And I get that that's part of attendance and stuff. But when in certain of those classes, I'll never be called on. So I'm required to have my camera on, but no questions are ever asked the students. So it's just a panel of people like sitting quiet. Um, and I think honestly, it would be better set for everyone to just feel better and be more comfortable in class if if having your camera on didn't count particularly as participation, where rather it was like getting asked questions or raising your hand or providing an answer. Um, I feel like that would just be a little bit of a better way to take attendance and stuff like that. Uh, secondly, I would have to say that going back again to having a centralized place for grading uh, would be super beneficial to me, even coming uh, from high school and stuff. I was super used to knowing my grades and even now I know my grades in one class, which is only a little bit stressful because we're at the end of the semester and I kind of, I'm just guessing how I'm doing, um, which is a little scary. Uh, and I, yeah, I think that using technology in in-person classes should be allowed. I have one class where I'm in person and I'm not allowed to use my iPad to take notes, which is is difficult for me. I use my iPad for everything for school. Um, and then paper and pencil and stuff is great and all, but I would like to have my notes central and organized. Um, and then things, I, would, I don't think there's anything particularly that I would say I would need to see less of except for uh, just the requirement to have cameras on when everyone's just sitting quiet. Thanks, Ethan. Patricia. Well, um, one of the things that I thought would be really helpful that I haven't seen, so I don't know if this is part of the learning that I just haven't been exposed to yet, but I would love to see interactive whiteboards. Um, that would be really, really helpful for visual learners to understand concepts. And I think it would increase student participation it would improve our interactions in groups. And there's just been times when even in a study group, for example, or when a professor is explaining something, you have to kind of go like this, see everybody, see, you know, like when you're trying to under explain like the US court system to an international student. So you're trying to explain it, you got your little diagram and you're going like this. And I, I'd love, to see interactive whiteboards. I don't know if that's part of something that I haven't seen yet or not, but that would make a huge difference for me because um, I'm a very visual learner. Um, I was just wondering too, is there like classroom lounges or anything, you know, a platform that encourages students to engage with each other outside of class, but online? I thought that that'd be excellent. I'm in a different situation than most. I'm very remote right now. At the present time, um, I'm taking my classes and I'm um, uh, in Michigan on the um, Upper Peninsula on Lake Superior. So I am really remote and I'm kind of traveling all over 
And this, so this has been, you know, really great for me. And I, I know there's a lot of people that started taking these classes that it would have been really hard for them to be on the campus. And so just because of like commuting um, at the hours, the, the money that it takes. So I, I'm hoping that the online learning will continue with um, a lot of classes being offered online. Um, but again, it's been, it's been wonderful for me. So that's really pretty much all I can think of right now. Great. Thanks, Patricia. And uh, Nahel, uh, last but not least, uh, talk to us a little bit about what you're looking forward to. Um, so I'd have to agree with Patricia and how I like the online learning. Um, I live in San Jose, so only like a 50 minute drive, but I commute twice a week because I no longer live in San Francisco. I commute twice a week and that's almost like four hours of my day that's just taken up just by driving up and down and then back and forth, right? Um, and I find that online learning has definitely helped my grades. Um, when I was living on campus, it was like, I was more worried about like either paying for rent or like figuring out even like what to eat or like simple things like that. Whereas living at home now, every like thing is kind of already done for me. So I have almost 24 seven to focus on school. And um, my grades have definitely shown that. And I found that um, like what he was saying about the camera being on and off, um, the classes that have worked the best for me were when the professor makes it optional mm -hmm. and students are more likely to like jump in and turn their camera on to answer a question. Um, rather than keeping your camera on the whole time, because sometimes it's kind of like distracting when you have to worry about your camera being on. And like, I get anxious over like small things. So I keep like looking back with the camera, looking back at the camera. And that just is like distracting from the class when I need to be like paying attention to the lecture and the professor talking. Um, but as far as like remote learning goes, I really like it. Um, just because like, I don't think I'll be moving back to San Francisco. It's just not the right time for me anymore. And it helps when I have classes from home compared to all the way um, in San Francisco, because four hours out of like a day is a lot mm -hmm. just to be driving. So I like it. Great. Thank you, Nahal. Um, uh, an additional question. So um, testing and assessments uh, during this period of time have uh, some been the same or different and sometimes challenging. Um, and so I wanted to kind of hear from any of you who want to jump in on this one. Uh, kind of what was your experience? Did you have, you know, did it change for you? Was test taking different than it had been prior? Um, and did you have issues with it? And did you deal with any sort of uh, cheating or kinds of concerns that came across in your classes or with your instructors? Um, you can chime in, any of you. Um, one thing for the online tests is students sign up for that specific class, like let's say Wednesday 8 to 9.15. That's the class I signed up for. So I would expect any test that needs to be given to be given in that time frame because that's the slot that I already set aside for that class. Some of my professors, like I have class, if I have class on a Tuesday, they'll assign the test on a Friday, but I don't have class on Friday. So it means I have work on Friday. So then I have to like go around my work schedule and find time to take that test, which has been the only like negative part I've seen about the test taking is that I would like it to be in the slot that I already chose for that class. Mm -hmm. Just like how it would be if we were in person. Um, I would like to add on that quickly that also sometimes when the exams or quizzes are not on the scheduled date for class, it also interferes with other classes that I already have. So I either take go to class or miss that class and take my quiz or exam instead or miss that quiz or exam. I think the only thing that I could say about tests and quizzes is that I've noticed that since I've begun, since online learning had started, the way that tests were given, I've noticed that some of the actual material on the tests 
not that it's getting it, it was the questions are more difficult or anything but sometimes i've noticed that like the material on the tests will be something that like we didn't learn in class and i don't know if this is like to prevent cheating or something like that um but i don't know if anyone any of the other panelists have experienced this but like i've noticed some of the tests will be or quizzes will have things on it that that wasn't covered in class or readings um and it's like inference knowledge i i don't know if that's a normal thing um, yeah, just adding on to what he said, that's actually very true because some of my professors teach multiple classes. So they'll teach the same class on, they'll teach the online version on Friday and then they'll teach the in-person one on Tuesday. And I feel that sometimes my professor mixes up what he's taught in the online class versus the in-person class. And the questions don't make sense. I'm like, we never went over this. Like, I, it's not on any of the slides. It's we just never went over it. I'm like, this came out of nowhere. This is like information that hasn't even been given yet. So I have noticed that. I've, I've had that experience as well, where there's been questions on tests and it's like, uh, I don't think we went over this. Um, yeah. And sometimes too, I, I get a little stressed um, with the time, you know, sometimes just feeling like maybe there's not enough time to complete um, the assessment. Thank you, thank you. So in the technology area where I work, uh, we like to think that technology is usually only part of the issue in any given uh, situation and that it's how the technology is used. When we talk to students a lot, one of the thing, and we ask about technology, we sometimes expect our millennial students to be incredibly techno technologically savvy and, um, and very interested in technology. We often get responses back about their use of technology and teaching as being much more reflective of the ways that their instructors use it and that they wish they would use it. And so with that in mind, do you have any reflections on that? And are there any things that any additional things you'd like to share with the instructors watching or who will watch? Um, about how they can work with technology in ways that would be um, more effective for your learning? I think that for, for my learning, what would help is a lot of the teachers, I, not a lot, I've had a few professors where I've noticed that they, they get, uh, they'll try and incorporate new technology into the course, whether it's like a new website or some type of new something. Um, and when they do that, it's great. The effort's great, but we have like the technology is already there to do exactly the same thing. You know, I can do that exact same module on iLearn or something, but it's that extra step that just seems to get skipped. Um, so I don't think it, it's as positive as someone may think, like a professor may think when they have a new website that hasn't been used before. Uh, I think it sometimes could be just be more beneficial to use what everybody already understands. Um, and just kind of apply it a little bit differently. And Ethan, I'll preface that by asking, you're, you're referring to, you have some instructors that use iLearn and some that use publisher-based websites or tools, and you're talking about the difference between those two things. Yeah, and as another add-on, like I have a, an old math class, I ended up leaving that math class at the beginning, but it, I was required to purchase another course separate from the learning to be able to, to do my calculus class which, you know, I, it was an extra $75 for a course. I don't know how often we would even be using. Um, speaking to, to that, to a few of my friends that are still in that course, they say they don't use it at all. Um, so they're saying they, they feel like they've lost out on, on the money for this thing that just wasn't necessary. One thing I do want to say is that I've noticed from other students that there are some professors who use different meeting platforms as well. So, for example, their classroom and, yeah, so their classroom and labs would be on Zoom, but their office hours would be on Skype. Mm -hmm. um, that's one interesting thing that I noticed, and I thought that was very weird and inconvenient because you would have to make a Skype account when we all have uh, Zoom. Everything for me has been very consistent. Zoom. I learn very, very consistent, which is really helpful. Um, because I'm not savvy in this. And so, um, you know, I think it's really important to 
just for professors not to make any assumptions as to what we do know with technology. Um, some of us don't know as much as, you know, some of the other students. So I think that, that that's really important too. And kind of directing us to things as far as, okay, this is how you work Zoom. Sometimes I, I will, like I said before, I'll have problems because I'm trying to be in a breakout room, but then I've got to ask, access something on Lexis, but then, and it's just hard for me to maneuver it. And then before you know it, I, I'm out of my room and I'm off of Zoom and, and everything. So that, that would be really helpful just to be directed at the very beginning as to here's where you go to kind of learn how to navigate some of these platforms. If I could jump in really, I just remembered one thing that I wanted to mention really quick, which was student center um, that as an entire thing uh, with it just being in my personal opinion, really outdated. Uh, and it makes, you know, the, the one with like the, the gray student center, I don't know which one that is, but it's just hard to navigate and all the links are weird and take you to like different places. Um, I just think as an overall, that just isn't the way to go. All right, and Nihal, I'll um, let you, I'll, yeah. okay, you, I'll let you and Joyce have the last word and then we're gonna switch to Q&A. So I don't know if like, this was something I could add, but when he mentioned the student center, I was like, okay, I'll add it anyway. Um, I know our whole school runs on like Microsoft um, and not Google. And I love Microsoft. I use Microsoft all the time. So it's no problem for me to send a Word file, turn it into a PDF. But a lot of my professors have continuously like repeated that they get so many emails from like their students of using Google Docs and they just can't open it. And sometimes they'll like, you know, if it's a third time the student has sent it in Google Doc. I mean, I know it's, it's like, it goes both ways. But if it's the third time that the student has sent it in Google Doc, they'll like deduct points just because they won't be able to open it. But I don't know if there could be like a way that they can access all files. That would be great because I've even gotten emails back. They're like, oh, I can't open this PDF or somehow it's sent in like an Adobe file and they can't open that or so yeah, that's one thing about that. Joyce. Um, yes, one thing I did wanted to add on to what Ethan said is that sometimes, um, this happened to me twice this semester where they do ask you to reset your password. And I have other students who've had uh, struggles even getting into their student center and it takes them a couple hours just to resolve that problem. And also when you do click on certain links on student center, it doesn't load and it requires you to log out and then log back in in order for that link to work correctly. Thanks. And thanks to all of you for going through this section of the panel. I really appreciate your responses, your candidness, and, um, and the way that you were just so willing to share your experiences. I want to shift gears now and turn our attention to the questions that came in from our attendees. And I'm going to turn it over to Rob and Olador, who's also from Academic Technology, who's going to who's going through the questions that have come in. Robin, take it away. Hi, everyone. Okay, so the first question that we're going to get into from the chat um, is a little bit more conceptual, uh, kind of generally asking about accessibility. So um, they're specifically asking in accessing course materials in multiple methods. So uh, watching things versus listening to things versus reading things. And this is something that I think Ethan specifically has already touched on. A lot of your answers have gone over this, but just to kind of get more specific into um, the different methods um, and how that impacted your learning. So I, I've, I've had two different professors where they'll post a recording of themselves on Zoom and in that recording, there'll be the slides. That um, does not work for me. When the Zoom and their slides are on one thing and you can't just like go back and forth. I liked it when the professors posted the videos of themselves in the lecture and then had another like box on iLearn where the slides were located. That's the what I found most useful when the slides were separate from the videos. I totally agree with that. Um, I think that having the, I didn't even realize that that was an issue until you mentioned it and that I've definitely experienced that multiple times. 
Um, having Google Slides available to look at after would be super amazing. Um, also, I think that with the professors, when I would be um, going through like different methods and stuff of learning, I think that the a lot of reading sometimes when it would be like that's all there is for the week, uh, even like when Zooms don't occur and it's just like read 60 pages. Um, I think that for a lot of students, at least that I've spoken to, they'll, you know, skim it or whatever. I, I do read all of it. I think that it would just be a tiny bit more um, beneficial to me to even be like taught that from the professor or something. I'm just more of a visual learner, I think. I would like to add something about the slides being posted separately. Um, one issue that I have found, it, it was only in one class, but the professor said that they would not record the session because it would force the students to pay attention and to attend class. And I thought that was a bit um, unfair because sometimes I would go in and I wouldn't be able to pay attention because other things are going on in the background. And if I would miss some things and I can't go back because the recording is not there and the notes are not there. So I'd have to rely on other students who they write their notes in the way that they understand. And I might not understand the way that they write their notes. So sometimes I get lost in the class that way because I have nothing to refer back to based on what was being taught that day or that lecture. We'll move on to the next one. Um, this, uh, this question is kind of related. Uh, do your professors give you more time to take your tests versus face-to-face -face or less time? Are you noticing that you have more time for your exams or less? I think that uh, for online, I, I've noticed that tests will be shorter than they are in person. At least that's how it has been for me. Uh, I think that Ms. Ms. Parabek mentioned that a little bit earlier and that the timing is a little difficult on online. Um, I know that hearing a few of my professors speak about it, they say that they lower the time for, you know, to prevent cheating and stuff like that and stuff. But I think that especially with these bigger tests, when we're expected to not be using notes and looking stuff up, it I do like, I do enjoy the extra time to read and take my time answering things. Yeah, I totally agree with what Ethan's saying. That that can be really stressful for me to feel like there's a time crunch with it. And there's one professor that actually gave an hour more. And that was really helpful for me, just put me at ease. So that's really important, yeah. Um, I feel like I'd say that I've seen both ends. So I do have professors where they, for example, only allow 20 minutes, but also expect us to turn it in and scan it, but also include a cover page and write the question and draw the diagram included all in that 20 minutes. But I've seen other professors where um, they would actually allow students to submit it online at the end of the day by 11 59 p.m and I thought wow what a big what a what a huge difference yeah I would say I agree with them on the, the professors that keep it open for a longer amount of time I've seen both ends like she said like a nine minute test compared to like an hour and 45 minutes to take a test um, and it does make a difference because even like on paper sometimes I would skip a question go down, keep working, and then be able to flip right back over to the question. But then in iLearn, like if I forget to flag it, I have to go through like 30 questions and try to find like where that question was. And that takes up a lot of the time. So I do, I've experienced both ends, but I like it when the professor does give us a little more time. It's, it's less stressful, I think. And especially with like the clock, just like ticking down right above your work. It's so nerve wracking. Right. And, you know, also, I think there's just different circumstances that will happen at home that are not going to happen when you're sitting in a classroom taking a test. And so that really does have to be accounted for. So I'm, I think it's really important to have a little more time. Yeah, I definitely agree with what she said, because um, I live at home, so I have like a daycare. So it's like 10 kids a day at my house. And then I have to do my Zoom class and test. Sometimes I had a time where I was taking a test at eight in the morning and some kid got hurt outside and we had to call 911. And honestly, the first thing my mom is going to do is yell my name and like, she needs help. So like, I'll go in the middle of my test. And usually if I was in class, 
you know, I wouldn't have heard about this issue until I got home. So it's like, I don't know, you got to kind of pick what's more important at that time, the test or like saving this kid. <laughs> okay, this one's a little bit more big picture. Has the modality of online in-person um, of your classes impacted your access to those classes or uh, had any impact on your degree progress? For me, it's only going to have impact if everything goes back to totally in person. That will have an impact on me, um, make it much harder. And then what was the first part of the question, please? I think it's the um, the online versus in person. Has that affected uh, your ability to kind of get the classes that you need? I think that's what they're getting at. Oh, not for me. I think for me, the online um, it was it was hard to get classes either way. When we were in person versus when we were online, I was always getting the last date to pick my classes. I was getting put on wait lists. I had to go and sit in professors' classes and. I mean, honestly, I think what saved me is that our university offers like summer and winter classes. And that's what put me like back on track. So I think it was the same regardless of whether we were online or in person. I guess um, maybe another way of saying this question is, do you think that um, doing online learning, the shift to online learning and how, how that's played out for you will affect your degree progress at all? To be completely honest, I think that the way that it, it has been going for me so far, it, it shouldn't affect my degree progress. And I feel like if it did, that really boils down to my responsibility. Um, I don't think there's anything that the school can really do or change to influence me picking my classes. Um, at least last semester, there was more than enough. I, I did end up doing it late because it was a little bit of a confusing process. Um, but yeah, I think that it, that falls on the student. Um, I would say in terms of my learning, when we have um, certain labs or classes where I have to, where it's more beneficial for students and people in the class to learn if they were in person. And when you learn from online or from videos or simulations, I don't feel like I'm not getting the full experience, but actually getting the full understanding of what I need to know. And so as I move on, it's hard to move on to the next class when I don't have the core knowledge of what I should know in that previous class. And I feel like I'm just moving th or weaving through the classes, um, not knowing everything that I should to help me prepare for the upper division. Everybody, I've got to jump in here to signal the end of our panel. I want to start by thanking our four panelists, Nihal, Patricia, Joyce, and Ethan. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. and. Uh, and sharing all of your experiences over the past 18 months. Um, really appreciate it. I also want to thank uh, Robin Oladort for helping organize and manage today. Thank you. And Christian Alvarado's in the back end, helping make sure everything goes smoothly as well. And to all the attendees, thank you for spending the time with us, for asking additional insightful questions. And I hope you really enjoyed it. Look forward to future events from the Academic Technology Advisory Committee on technology and on teaching and learning. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and close the panel.